think that the bottom line is that the US-China geopolitical tension will create a more opportunities overall for Korean companies. But Korea, there are multiple new players that have become much larger. So in that process, the founders became you know, very rich billionaires and so forth. I think that, that, that is good for the society and also good for the investors like us. We can always find newer companies and buy it earlier still. Right now is a good time to invest in Korea because last year, Korean economy slowed down, but it's turning around and we, we expect the, the Korean economy to grow uh, faster than before. And also the valuation is cheap, but there is a strong possibility of uh, multiple expansion because of the corporate governance improvement and also a strong possibility, probably not this year, but uh, of uh, upgrading to the developed market uh, in the MSCI index. Dear viewers of Good Investing Talks, it's great to have you back and it's great to have Albert Young and Chan Lee of Petra Capital back. Albert um, and Chan, maybe you introduce yourself for a second because people might not know you and they can get to know you with the other interview that's linked above here. So if you're curious to learn more about investing in Korea, watch this interview. But now the floor is yours, Albert and Chan. Thank you, Tillman, for having us again. Hi, my name is Chan Lee. I'm the managing partner of Petra Capital Management. Petra is a value-oriented investment manager based in Seoul, Korea, and we manage assets on behalf of a selected group of university endowments, sovereign wealth funds, charitable organizations, and family offices. Uh, the firm was co-founded by, my, by myself and Arbert in 2009, but our friendship goes way back to 1995 uh, when we were both graduate students at UCLA. Thanks, Tillman. Uh, I'm Albert Young. At Petra, we are committed to creating long-term value for our clients by buying great businesses at undervalued prices. But from time to time, we engage with the management to unlock shareholder value. So the most important question for you two, as you've been a while in the game, who is telling the better jokes? Is it Chan or Albert? Uh, <laughs> I think it's me, but Arbor probably thinks otherwise. <laughs> we have to find out in the due diligence process. <laughs> yeah. But now let's get serious. Let's start with an easy question. Um, is Korea the winner of the China-US conflict? Oh, yes, uh, unless the tension between the US-China escalates into a larger military fight, many Korean industries and companies benefit from the current tension. The purpose of the U.S. policy towards China is to exclude China from the global value chains in the key industries such as semiconductor, renewables, and the telecoms, etc. The Through Chips Act, the U.S. is trying to re restrict China's access uh, to key technologies in semiconductor because China is some years behind uh, the, the top technologies. And also through IRA, the US, the government is trying to ban Chinese EVs and EV batteries in the US market because in that area, China is leading one of the leaders in the world. And also US government is trying to curb investments in China to, to limit uh, the advancement of the key technologies there. Yeah, so we think that the bottom line is that the US-China geopolitical tension will create a more opportunities overall for Korean companies to gain market share in the uh, global market. As I mentioned, for example, EV battery sector is clearly one major industry that will benefit from this growing economic spat between US and China. So even without tr friction, the Korean companies are doing fine. But with this friction, basically, Chinese products are banned in US, which creates a protective market for uh, Korean companies. Uh, it's, it's mostly starting in U.S., but to a certain extent, I think their policy is also influencing uh, European countries. So it will be, uh, I'll be very surprised if you see any uh, Chinese uh, EV cars uh, being sold in U.S. And also in, 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 in Europe, to a certain extent, uh, there are some Chinese cars that are being sold, but, but longer term, we're probably uh, replaced by European cars, but batteries made, made from Korea. Basically, it's, it's now it's almost uh, inevitable that, that there, there are going to be two economic blocks. One is the Western bloc led by U.S. and then the Western world. 
and the other block is China, which is which is huge. But basically, uh, before I'll say there was more f free flowing of activities between two blocks, but because of this uh, the tension between U.S. and China, uh, they're likely to be uh, two major blocks. And while the, the interchanges are, are going to be still be there, but it's not going to be as free flowing as before. So, it, so for Korean companies, basically they'll belong to the part of the Western bloc. And then I think uh, it's, uh, so if you look at the export numbers in the past, it was more to China, but starting a couple of years ago, now Korean companies are exporting more to US and also forced to do more business in the US because of the IRA and so forth that Korean companies are actually moving their factories to US. Let's switch from geopolitics, uh, which is also important to think about investing more in the depth of investing. Uh, how has the investing atmosphere in Korea changed in the last two years? So recently, the, the Korean government has witnessed uh, what uh, the Japanese government has done to improve the corporate governance in Japan. That's probably one of the reasons why the, the Japanese market performed strongly last year and also the early this year. The Korean government is also trying to take many measures to improve the corporate governance, but not just the government, but many investors, both local and foreign, are actively uh, trying to, to make the management and many companies to improve uh, shareholder value and return more cash to shareholders. That's why I expect uh, the Korean market to perform well this year and, uh, and going forward. Is there also more pressure from activists in Korea or how has activism changed? Yeah, I would say that uh, more recently there are more local and foreign activists are uh, agitating companies. And, and so similar to Japan, in the past, the word activism was not socially accepted. But now because what we've seen in Japan and, and how uh, a lot of investors in Korea, even local and retail investors, came to the conclusion that Korea discount is not good for the country, not certain enough for their wealth, and uh, people are beginning to actually demand some changes. Uh, that's mostly on the management to change their shareholder policy, uh, paying more dividends, and then treating the uh, minority shareholders um, as if they're the full owners of the company rather than just uh, uh, shareholders without any vote. So. I think uh, that is going to have a, have a positive impact. And we've seen that in Taiwan and more recently in Japan. And so the trend is there. And I think that Korea will go through the same exercise. And so in that process, Korea discount is likely to get reduced in the longer term. So when I did the research for the interview, you were called friendly activists uh, by another investor. So how do you do activism in Korea? So we at Petra, we are basically a value investor, but from time to time, we uh, try to influence or persuade or convince the management to unlock the shareholder value, to improve the shareholder value and return excess cash to shareholders. So the key to us is to, uh, to find the management who are willing to change. That's our style of uh, activism, but we would say we are uh, more an engagement player rather than a hostile activist. Yeah, for really hardcore activists, we want our strategy is not even considered to be activists. We're more shoulder engagement in a sense that if we think that the company has opportunity to increase its value by uh, paying out more dividends or you know, buying back shares and canceling them, especially if they're sitting on a large amount of cash that are, are being unused, that's the extent to which we'll get engaged. We don't intend to uh, ever change the CEO or try to break up the company because that's not what we do as investor. We uh, are going to get only engaged whenever we see there is a possibility of improving the, improving the shareholder value when the their capital allocation policies is not being fully uh, utilized. How is your competition in Korea? So what makes Petra Capital stand out compared to other firms in the Korean market? So in Korea, we think that uh, the percentage of value investors is small. And uh, even then, most of them are not true value investors to us. Most of them are just uh, investors who are buying low multiple stocks. 
And many of the, the firms are part of the, the large conglomerate or the, the big financial group and not truly independent. So that's uh, how we see the market environment in Korea. And uh, also that Petra, we are, of course, we are located in Seoul and we've been investing in Korean stocks for many years. But at the same time, we are also global. That's the key these days because most industries in Korea and over of the world are truly global. So we have to be global at the same time. As you know, we met you a couple of times in Omaha. We are a really true value investor uh, uh, in the, the sense of the Benjamin Graham and Charlie Munger, meaning that we do uh, all of our investing with a bottom-up approach and we do uh, spend a lot of time on uh, research, performing our own in-depth research as well as fundamental analysis and then trying to find a price that is cheaper than much cheaper than much discounted to the entry value that we have uh, calculated uh, from the target. So to do this correctly, um, you need to, uh, to have a really strong research function and then we'll be willing to spend a lot of time and also willing to be very patient. But we see that a lot of competitors or investors uh, here in Korea are not either not as uh, patient or they rely on the research done by some, some other people and uh, they don't go into a very deep analysis of the companies. So I think that's where we, uh, we're uh, different because we've uh, lived in Korea for many years. We spent all of our career uh, looking at Korean companies. So we do think that we have some insight and then uh, a deeper understanding of Korean businesses and uh, uh, that we can analyze companies, appraise companies more correctly than other competitors. So to follow up a bit, you also seem to have a very patient capital base, which is your advantage. Yeah, that is uh, true. But that's because our strategy is to, to buy the stocks for the long term, to create values for the long term. That attracts Again, long-term minded investors. That's why we have long-term investors mostly as our capital base. Yeah, so our investors are slightly different from the typical Korean short-term investors in the sense that you know, they don't, they're willing to uh, withstand some underperformance uh, in quarterly basis or even yearly basis because we really look at our investment horizon to be three to five years. So we view investing to be more like a marathon, not a sprint, meaning that you know, we're not trying to win every uh, one kilometer yardstick. Uh, we want to win the marathon, but, you know, we pace ourselves and then get to the, you know, be in the first place at the end of the marathon rather than try to beat uh, each uh, one kilometer uh, interval. So uh, I think that's a key, to, uh, key concept to our uh, investment approach. So that means, you know, we're, we're willing to invest in companies that are maybe not as popular or maybe misunderstood by the market at this point. But if we can wait six months, two years, and then, you know, have the right uh, patience, then I think the, the fundamental value of the company will actually uh, uh, play out at the end. What are these companies? So can you maybe give one or two examples companies you're invested in? Uh, maybe each of you can give an example. So what do you pick, Albert? Yeah, one of the examples is, uh, is a big company, the Hyundai Motor. But um, we bought uh, the preferred stock of Hyundai Motor. The Hyundai Motor is a global brand. And um, the recently, it's, it ranks the third in terms of volume. But even um, seven or 10 years ago, it ranked seventh or eighth and uh, ninth uh, in the global market. And especially in the EV industry, it's a new market, it's fifth. And uh, outside of China, it's even higher. And in terms of technology in EV cars, and probably thanks to the, the huge value chains located in Korea, the, in terms of the EV batteries, and uh, the, if you look at uh, the technology, the, the range of the EV cars is probably the, 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 the longest uh, in the world, uh, the, one of the, the recent the Hyundai cars. And the, 
if you look at the price between the common stock and uh, the preferred stock, the gap, theoretically, in theory, the gap shouldn't exist. But the gap has been around, uh, has been about 50%. And at the price of the preferred stock, it trades only at two or three times its earnings. And the dividend yield is even high, it's 7%. And it also owns one third, of th uh, roughly uh, 33% of Kia Motor, which is also one of the, the, the main the automobile company in Korea. And so we think it's one of the cheapest uh, stocks in Korea. But if you can say that most automobile companies in the world trade at a low multiple, but yes, that's true. But that probably because the uncertainties surrounding the transition to EVs. But we think the Hyundai is likely to survive in, in once the transition is complete. So given that fact and the current the profitability and valuation, we think it's one of the cheapest stocks. Recently, this year, the, the, especially the preferred stock, the, the went up uh, a lot and the gap now is still 40% instead of 50%, but still we think it's uh, the one of the most undervalued stocks in Korea. It's one of the major holdings in, for us. You have no fear that it gets crushed by Chinese competitors like BYD or others? Oh, of course, I cannot say there is zero risk, but we think that, uh, of course, BYD is a strong competitor, but uh, it, that doesn't mean that the BYD it, will to crush all the other competitors. And Korea, also, if you look at the EVs and EV batteries, one of the leaders alongside China. So we don't, uh, we never think that uh, the Hyundai will be crushed by BYD. No, that's also the related topic that we discussed earlier, the US tension, right? US Chinese tension, meaning, you know, virtually no Chinese cars are sold in Korea, no Chinese cars are sold in US, which is the largest uh, auto market. And, uh, and Germans, you know, obviously they used to make Uh, competitive cars, but not the EV cars, but they're likely to use Korean batteries. So uh, I think the it does the, the tension creates. You know, already Hyundai is quite competitive, but it creates protected market, and I think the Hyundai will benefit from that. And uh, already in the U.S., they're number two after Tesla in terms of the EV EV cars sold. Um, so I think the Hyundai it didn't read this extra protection, but You know, sometimes you get lucky, and in this case, I think the Hyundai will probably survive as one of the legacy players that makes a successful transition into uh, EV EV cars. Chen, do you also have a, you want to share as an example for your investing strategy? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, Hyundai is a brand that everyone recognizes. So, so I, I decided to pick this one company called Young One. It spells it as Y O U N G and One, but it has nothing to do with the age or being young, but this is a fashion company. It's a global manufacturer of OEM sportswear and casual outdoor apparels for major brands. Uh, may I ask which, I, I, you wear uh, I read, Uti, but- I read daily. Is there? It's a European brand. Okay. Okay, because uh, it uh, the young one makes it, makes the clothes for the North Face, Lululemon, Patagonia, and uh, all kinds of uh, major brands. Um, so, Nobody knows it because they're the OEM manufacturer, but they're known in the industry because they design together with uh, these brands. So not only they make clothes for Lululemon or yoga clothes for Lululemon, but they design together. So their margin is higher. And also interestingly that they also happen to be uh, a 51% owner of a company called Scott, which is the, the high-end uh, cycle brand based in Switzerland. Um, And you know they make really expensive bikes, including e-bikes. They're uh, very popular amongst the cyclists. And with together, they make uh, well over 500 million net income. But they're only trading at two billion dollar valuation, which means they're only four times its earning. And uh, another good thing about this company is they're sitting on about a billion dollar in cash because they're so successful uh, at what they're doing. So if you take out the cash, it's even it's even cheaper. So we think that this is a company that is not that well understood because the name is strange, first of all. Nobody uh, follows this small company, but I think the sooner or later, people will begin to recognize this company. And then once people recognize value in the company, and uh, then stock price will likely to move. So uh, it's a company called Young One. 
you mentioned like Korea is not the, the largest market. So as an example, how much of the revenue of the companies you mentioned is export or generally how high is the degree of export in your portfolio? Yes. So for example, Young One, I think is 90% outside of Korea, right? The Patagonia, Lululemon, they're popular brands in Europe, US and other parts of Asia. And uh, in, in Young One case, it's more, more than 90%. But Hyundai is also more like 70%. So we're not really focusing on export only, but a lot of successful Korean companies that are growing, they're likely to be a more uh, global player or at least a regional player because that's where the growth is coming. Because domestically, Korea is, you know, sizable, 50 million people, but population is not, it's not growing. And it's hard to expect growth within the domestic market. So revenues outside of Korea probably uh, should be the right measure instead of export because, for example, Young One has factories mostly in Bangladesh, so that's not the export from Korea. So, but overall, uh, if we, when we look at our portfolio companies, about the roughly 60% the revenues come from outside of Korea. That's more than uh, the average. And we think that uh, many Korean companies are expanding outside of Korea, even though the Korean economy is not growing fast. So basically, the the buying, uh, the investing in Korean market is buying, uh, expanding global Korean companies rather than betting on the Korean market. So, so what Korea is trying to become is more like a, I don't know if it's the right word to say, but like Germany, <laughs> Germany of Europe. You're based in Germany, but you sell all over Europe. You dominate the European market. Here, at least for the time being, because Korean products are very popular, considered to be very high quality. and you know, you add in the, the popularity of Korean pop culture, you know, the K-pop, the music, and then movies. Uh, you'll be surprised when you, you meet any teenagers in Asia, all of them want to buy Korean products, whether it's Korean car, Korean phone, or even like the food and beverages. So we see that this will uh, be a quite uh, uh, interesting uh, phenomena that will, you know, last for a while and the Korean companies are benefiting and our portfolio companies are reflective of their success outside of Korea. You've been quite some time in the market. Um, and for me, the question comes up, do we already know all the stocks in Korea or is how is your idea generation pr process going? Oh, of course, we know not probably all, the most of the stocks in Korea. We've been in investing in Korea for more than two or 20 years. And but again, we look at, we use uh, basically our screening tool to screen out to, to find uh, the undervalued stocks. But we look at the various factors. We look at uh, the, the industry, we look at the management, we look at uh, each company's uh, the competitors and also the clients and suppliers. So, the, 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 and also we meet a lot of industry people and we also talk to the people in other, other uh, the management companies and security firms. So it's just not just one tool. We, uh, we source uh, our targets uh, from various ways. Yeah, because we are technically, Korea is technically emerging market. That means the market is very volatile. So even when companies fundamental is fantastic, if something happens in North Korea, something happens in the US, interest rate goes up, then Korean companies are uh, negatively effect affected. So we always look for, we have a list of very competitive Korean companies, but we are looking for time to buy them cheap. So whenever the market tanks because of the macro or other reasons that, as I described, then we, uh, we invest in those companies. So, you know, we're not betting on the market as, you know, as an as a activist or, or active managers, we're picking 20 to 30 names. And so for us, we're trying to find the best value in paying the cheapest possible for the highest quality businesses. But you also have this, this different themes you look for in new opportunities, especially so just this growth themes like K-pop, the specialized engineering, and you name the other two in your approach. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. The K-pop related, uh, that's uh, the mostly consumer brands that benefit from the popularity of the Korean culture. But another one is that uh, we briefly talked about uh, the manufacturing and uh, Korea is strong in high-tech manufacturing, especially in semiconductor 
and as also the EVs and EV batteries. And also, not just manufacturing itself, Korea is strong in, uh, has strong consumer brands and technology as well. For example, Samsung in smartphones and the home, the appliances uh, is dominated by Korean companies and even automobile. As uh, I talk, briefly talked about Hyundai, it's uh, one of the global brands. And uh, also in Korea, there, it's not that well known outside of the Korea, but Korea the, is very uh, dynamic and entrepreneurial. And uh, the size of the VC investment uh, compared to GDP is one of the highest in the world. So we have many new ideas uh, emerging in Korea. It, not many people know uh, many new business models start in Korea. The examples are the music streaming or user created create contents and messaging all start in Korea, although they fail to dominate uh, the market outside of Korea. So we see a lot of uh, new business models emerging. We, so we look at uh, new companies. So there are many uh, areas we, uh, we look at, many promising areas. Yeah, also the, because Korea, it's uh, the most, most interesting or most attractive, the, re, the attractiveness about Korean market is evaluation. So we look at companies that are misunderstood so like, you know, the typical sum of the parts, uh, when you add uh, three parts, four parts together, but it's only valued like one, then like the Porsche Hathaway is an example. But so we look at a lot of the complex structures that the Korean companies have. And some people will say, uh, I want to stay away because it's hard to analyze. But for us, when there's a difficulty, then there's opportunity. So we think that we're good at dissecting uh, these complex structures and figuring out where the true value is. So we also look at these uh, complex structures and trying to figure out uh, where the real value is. So we, we look at some, some of the mispriced opportunities. And uh, also the engagement is somewhat related to this, this uh, strategy, meaning that as I described in, in the young one's case, if the company is doing fine, but they did so well that they built cash, but they haven't done anything with the cash, you know, they didn't acquire a company or they didn't do anything, then the right thing for them to do is return cash or you know, buy back shares and cancel. And that's the new thing that I think the Korean companies are likely to uh, uh, engage in. And that's where our sort of the engagement strategy. So you write them a nice letter or visit them at a capital market conference and talk to them. Yes, very polite letter. <laughs> and then, you know, visit them with the uh, but but also think about Korea. It's, it's a small country, so you know basically within one hour, most of the companies are you know based in Seoul. And but if you stretch out to Busan or Jeju, which is more southern, we can still go within three hours. So uh, for us, we do have an advantage of being able to meet with the management to see what they think about other shareholders and if they are uh, honest or uh, you know what they think about the future. Those are sort of sometimes quite important in the engagement type of situations, as well as uh, I think the quality, qualitative aspect of management is also uh, very important. Uh, so we can't really measure companies just based on the, the matrix. How entrepreneurial is the Korean ecosystem? So are there new, a lot of new companies coming to the public markets? Uh, I think. There was some talking about VC in Korea, which might be quite interesting. What is your take on this? So it's true that uh, the IPO market is very vibrant in Korea. And uh, one good thing is that uh, many Korean companies go public at an early stage compared to the US. The US, the companies tend to go public at a very later stage. So that's not good for the public market investors, but in Korea, most companies go public early, so uh, we can buy the good business at an early stage. So if you look at, for example, the top, top 20 names, top two largest companies in Korea, now versus 20 years ago, half of them have switched. Meaning that they're newer companies, whether they're in the uh, newer technology, or maybe this old company that actually move into the battery business like LG Chem. There are a lot of changes. Um, and the Koreans are, I think, very good at adapting to new environment. So 
that's a good indication. If you look at a lot of European countries, once again, I mean, I'm a bit uh, biased here, but you look at the names of the companies, they, you only recognize the old names. You don't really see too many new names. But where in the U.S., you see so many new names. If you look at the you know, many magnificent seven companies that they were not, you know, half of them weren't even around 20 years ago. Uh, so similarly, maybe not that extent uh, like U.S., but Korea, there are multiple new players that have become much larger. So in that process, the founders became, you know, very rich billionaires and so forth. And then that, that, that is good for the society and also good for the investors like us, because we can always find newer companies and buy at an earlier stage. And another good proxy to, to look at how entrepreneurial the Korea the economy is that to look at, at the top 10 or her 20 richest uh, per people in Korea. And more than half of them are entrepreneurs, but that's not the case in most countries, probably except the US. Yeah, so this, these companies are founders, managed company like, you know, NVIDIA, and, the meta and so similar. And the uh, good thing about them is they're also pretty, uh, they're different from the conglomerate mentality. You know, they're trying to build empire buying unnecessary businesses or unrelated businesses. And then, you know, try to you know, so maybe screw is too, too strong or screw other shareholders, but they don't think that way. They're, they're more, they're uh, compounders. So their interest, interest is very uh, strongly aligned with the, the minority shareholders. So we like those companies that are founder uh, managed companies that have a uh, uh, desire to become bigger. Hey, Tillman here. It's great that you've made it that far into the video. And I think it shows a certain passion for investing you're having. If you wanna dive deeper and go further down the rabbit hole, you're invited to apply to my community, Good Investing Plus. It's a place that's very helpful to people who are ambitious about investing. Uh, it's helpful to investment talent as well as um, experienced fund managers. So if you're interested, please click on the link below. And now, without further ado, enjoy the conversation. How is your research process going if you discover an interesting idea? Maybe let's take the K-pop example. So do you go to concerts and see what's coming up there or what is? how do you access uh, interesting companies and research them uh, in d different fields or the K-pop field. Yeah, we, we do get a lot of help. Like, you know, I mean, we're the founders, but we do have other analysts, younger analysts who are more uh, well tuned into the K-pop. But we, you know, meet with industry experts. We meet, for example, the K-pop, we meet with other musical label executives. You know, we go to the you know, concerts, as you mentioned, you know, and then we also go to uh, the industry gatherings where they exchange ideas. And, um, and also we meet up with the artists, the former employees, the competitors, and then people in the uh, related businesses, like content businesses, uh, maybe not necessarily K-pop, but even knowing about how the movies and dramas, because the, the music is a big part of their uh, product. So we go through the basically 360 degree uh, research. Uh, I think that helps us. I know the K-pop is a bit more interesting, but even semiconductor. I mean, it's, it's, we actually visit factories. We meet with the industry experts, the scientists, uh, the vendors, the people that got fired from the company, people that uh, are professors. So we do try to meet everybody that are relevant so that we can... Uh, have a better understanding of the industries and the companies. Do you have something, Albert, on the research process? Oh, yeah, as, uh, as Chen uh, mentioned, and we uh, use various activities to try to understand the business. For, for, for example, when we analyze semiconductor business, uh, for example, when we buy memory manufacturers like the Samsung and the, Hyund the SK Hynix, we just uh, not just try to understand the memory itself. But we uh, the look at, uh, also we also invest in many um, smaller companies in the value chain. So we know a lot of them. So we look at in industry as a whole. And 
we also uh, we not, not just meet the 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 IR people from Samsung, we also meet a lot of engineers. I personally know a lot of engineers in Samsung because I also studied uh, electrical engineering at college. So, and also most of the, the smaller value chain companies, even we have known them when even before they went, went public. So we just know the ind industry thoroughly. So that's uh, our approach. And just, just like to, to win the war, you need, you just, you need uh, not just army, but you, you need the Navy and Air Force. So you need the uh, a lot of uh, the, the angles too. Yes, also because the Korea is a big exporter. So, you know, we don't necessarily limit ourselves just looking at the Korean materials or Korean newspapers. We try to read what other people say about Korean products, you know, try to uh, read the Chinese newspaper, of course, the Financial Times and all the English uh, uh, publications. And also even for concert, for example, we have like if, if our, one of our analysts is traveling to Thailand, we ask him to go to concert, Blackpink concert in Thailand. We ask the, the analyst to go to supermarket, try to see if they're really buying Korean snacks. And a recent trip, I think Arbor to China, I think he went to uh, uh, try to buy some Korean ramen and he saw a bunch of them there. So it's, uh, you know, our research is basically a part of our daily life. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, we, you know, we do our work at office too, but you know, basically, we try to study the business, study the brands, study uh, what is uh, who's making money, basically. Um, so, I think the the advantage that we have is that uh, our, a lot of our in, the investing team members are bilingual, and uh, we tend to travel a lot. So, um, you know, we try to see the uh, the views from other outsiders of Korea. But Albert was also allowed to eat some Chinese food. He only have is allowed to try uh, Korean food in China. <laughs> yeah, but that, yeah, as Chen, as Chen mentioned, that uh, even when I uh, travel personally, I always try to uh, to find something. So I always visit uh, even small mom and pop stores and big supermarkets, and also look at uh, the brands of the cars and just everything. So it's part of the research. It, uh, it's just part of our life. How do you construct your portfolio in Korea? Um, so what mental models do you use? Um, you have this mentioned 20 to 30 stocks, but how do you select them? Is there an idea to have defensive part, more offensive part, or is it just driven on your valuation? Um, yeah, of course, the, our, the, the primary criteria is to buy undervalued stocks. stocks. The, with the larger, the large, larger margin of safety, so we try to to to, to buy uh, undervalued stocks. That's basically how we construct our portfolio. But we also look at uh, the industry weighting because, of course, we never try to uh, the follow the weighting of the market. But we try to make sure that uh, our portfolio is is somewhat diversified because when we buy just that uh, simply buy uh, undervalued stocks. Sometimes we buy only stocks in one or two industries. So we try not to, uh, to concentrate, concentrate on one or few industries. So we try to concentrate, but at the same, uh, that we try to be di diversified as well. So we try to strike the right balance. Because uh, if you just focus on too much on value, you know, given the market sentiment or market situation, one sector could be so much cheaper than others. But we don't want to put everything in that one basket. That happened maybe a couple of years ago in the semiconductor business. Um, so we do, to just keep ourselves honest and make sure we're diversified, we uh, compare our sector composition with the, uh, the market composition. And then we assess the attractiveness of each sector. So it's basically a combination of value and then the, the prospects, but you know we do uh, you know pay attention to the sector weighting and and so forth, so that make sure we're not biased toward, toward one sector. You know, although our investors allow us to underperform the market, um, we don't want to put all of our money in one sector, one basket. That will be uh, uh, we always say that will be too risky. Um, so, you know, for us, yeah, we want to be uh, strong in offense, but we still want to be uh, want to stay uh, play strong defense. 
How do you make sure that the portfolio is resilient so that, for instance, a factor problem with exports to Thailand and China not influences you too much or... Um... So that's why we try to understand the business uh, thoroughly. So we try to, and also that's why we don't buy just one or two stocks. So we think if we understand uh, each business uh, do well, then buying 20 to 30 stocks are full, uh, that we can be fairly diversified, fairly resilient to, to any risks. And also we keep monitoring the developments in each of our portfolio companies. So that way we try to uh, reduce risks. No, because the our goal is to buy the highest quality business at the cheapest valuation. So meaning that once that by definition, once we make a buying decision, that the likely that it is likely that the company has very uh, high margin of safety, has a very uh, good business model, and they offer durable products with brands, and they're likely to uh, suffer less when there's economic downturn. So it's uh, bottom up, so it's, it's company specific, but we look at, you know, to think about the worst situation. What happens if there is uh, suddenly uh, China bans Korean uh, products and we'll see you know if are they too much exposed to China or do they are they able to sell in their products in India or elsewhere uh, you know that kind of stuff so basically it is uh, a constant uh, uh, review of the potential downfall as well as the vulnerability to uh, macro situation and and when we conclude to buy that means we think that these companies are likely to uh, of course the short term they could be affected, but we always think about the long term. Is there anything you want to add? Because I've ended my question list for the interview. Uh, something that's interesting to know about Korea, something we haven't discussed. Feel free. Oh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's uh, a good time. Right now is a good time to invest in Korea because last year, Korean economy slowed down. But it's turning around, and we we expect uh, the Korean economy is grow uh, the faster than before, and also the valuation is cheap. But there is a strong possibility of uh, multiple expansion because of the corporate governance improvement, and also a strong possibility, probably not this year, but uh, of uh, upgrading to the developed market uh, in the MSCI index, and also the exchange rate. The Korean one, along with most other Asian currencies, that depreciated against the U.S. dollar since uh, the pandemic started. Uh, but now we think that once the U.S. Fed pivots to, to lowering the, the rate, then probably that will affect the, the, all the global currencies and especially Asian currencies, including the Korean currency. So we think that uh, the current market, also the, the, as we said uh, the earlier, that we have many prime missing industries as well. So it's a good time to invest in Korean stocks. Yeah. So also, you know, we started our firm in 2009, but, uh, you know, since then, I mean, Korean market actually has done quite uh, poorly. The annualized return since September 2009 for the market benchmark is 3.4% annualized uh, compared to what has done in uh, only the worst market is probably China because of the recent downfall. The U.S. done so much better and India and so forth. So I think, but, you know, that type of uh, trend will, cannot be, uh, cannot last forever, which means, you know, if you go back to 10 years ago, th th this is when actually emerging market was doing better than the U.S. market. So I think given the valuation and given the trend, we think that uh, it may be, you know, the, the emerging market, including Korea, will come back. And I think the good time to invest is when the people are pessimistic. So as you know, the famously famous saying that bull markets are born on pessimism. And we think the Korea may be uh, the right place to invest. And um, and you add in the factor that governance will improve. And you know, in Japan, it took almost 25 years for them to recover back to where they were. So, you know, compared to that, Korea is not that bad. And also the as we mentioned, we're not really betting on the market. That proves why, you know, despite the lack, lackluster market performance, you know, our fund 
has done over 10 percent annually in the past 15 years. So we think that if you can uh, be a little bit more adventuresome and be uh, sort of uh, you know have the uh, courage to look into something different and then spend a lot of time on uh, studying companies, I think uh, there is actually a, a lot of opportunities for value hunters in Korea. Maybe a last question, because you mentioned this upgrade from de uh, developing to developed market. What do you mean for Korea also in terms of flows? Because if as a developed market, I think it's more interesting for certain buyers to invest in Korea then? So I think many, uh, of course, not all the, the global investors, they just follow the, the index weighting. So there we expect, uh, that's why we expect more capital inflows once uh, the market is upgraded to a developed market status. Yeah, that's right. Because the emerging market, it tends to attract certain type of investors. They're more volatile. Whenever there is some kind of a crisis or perceived crisis, then people pull out of money. That's the sort of a, right now, Korean market suffered last year compared to other developed market is because of China risk. And uh, once we become developed market, then we'll attract certain type of more and more pension, more sovereign wealth fund type of investors who tend to have a more long-term view. That means then we will be probably subject to less volatility and then also uh, more inflow of the, the sort of the more stable capital. So in that, I think it will be positive. I think some uh, global investment bank, I think it was Goldman Sachs said, if the Korea moves to the developed market status, then net flow of 60 billion. That, that's how they calculated. I'm, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but uh, they, they seem to think that it's a net positive. When investors buy uh, emerging markets, their basic idea is to buy growing economies such as China and India. And Korea is no longer growing rapidly. It's more of a the mature economy. So Korea remains in that category is a net negative to, for, for Korean market, I think. Yeah. So tell me, I would encourage you to visit the Korea and to see yourself. I mean, you know, the MSCI continues to put Korea to be an you know, emerging market, but in terms of infrastructure, technology, education, all the numbers, I mean, it is 13th largest in the world, but to put Korea in the same basket with the, you know, Argentina, Turkey, South Africa, um, I think is, you know, nonsense. Um, and as you know, the IMF already classifies Korea to be an advanced economy. And so does FTSE. This is the MSCI. It's the Americans. <laughs> They're uh, persistent, but it also has to do with the, their business as well, because the index is, uh, is a big business. Korea is a big part of the emerging market. But, but at the end, any category in the longer term should reflect the reality. So I think the Korea will definitely move to the... Uh, Developed market status, maybe not next year, but in few years for sure. The estimated sixty billion. What do they mean in comparison to the current market cap of Korean market? Korean uh, market cap is about uh, two trillion dollars. So it's not a huge plus, but it's a net meaning. Uh, so it, it, it is a positive plus. You know, we mentioned about the retail getting bigger in Korea. So at least we won't see too many uh, people pulling out of money. So for example, since COVID, I think the, a lot of international investors pulled out of money. I think it's, it's uh, well beyond, I think 50 billion is the total amount of the net outflow since COVID. So, you know, you add in, I mean, it, it is a small compared to the large size of the market, but it's a small number that makes the, the, makes the market to move. Then thank you very much for the interview and uh, thank you very much for your sharing the insights on Korea. And thank you much for the audience listening till now. And uh, I hope to see you soon again. And for now, it's bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you very me. much. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please leave a like and a comment and for sure subscribe to my channel. Traditionally, I want to close this conversation with the disclaimer. So here you can find the disclaimer. It says, um, please do your own work. This is no recommendation. 
What we are doing here is just a qualified talk that helps you, but it's no recommendation. Please always do your own work. Thank you and hope to see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.